Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship at Emmanuel. This past Wednesday, I left a conference in Chicago at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, drove with a colleague all the way up to Green Bay, dropped him off at his church, and then drove all the way back Highway 54 at about 10.30 at night, and the snow started falling. It was a good time to have head beam, head, headlights and high beams on the truck. It's, it's a reminder that when we live in a world that is full of darkness and, and sometimes has so much around us that confuses us and frightens us, we have a Savior who reveals himself to us and, and uses a phrase in today's service, I am the light of the world, the light shining in the darkness that gives people direction and also helps us see the glory of our Savior. That's going to be the theme of our worship in the third week of this sermon series, Jesus Appears, as we're celebrating the epiphany season and Jesus shines his light. We'll follow the order of service that you hopefully received on your way into the sanctuary. It also gives us a chance to celebrate the Lord's Supper tonight. Our service begins with the opening hymn, number 381, The People Who in Darkness Walked, God's Richest Blessings on Our Worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me. A sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. 
He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, you sent your Son to proclaim your kingdom and teach with authority. Anoint us with the power of your Spirit so that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. If you were to go back in time to a moment about seven centuries before Jesus was born and spend time with the people of Israel, you would quickly notice that the outlook that they had on life wasn't exactly very bright. Israel was one of the nations that lay in the crosshairs of a world power called the Assyrian Empire, and it would only be a few years before those tribes of Israel would be carried off into either exile or completely obliterated from the earth. And yet God still sent his messengers to his chosen people with words of promise and prophecy that he had his eye on them and that his light would still shine to the ends of the earth. These words from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapters 8 and 9, serve as the basis for this weekend's sermon. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. 
The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's join together to sing Psalm 27. You'll find words and music on page 10. We'll join to sing the refrains and the glory be to the Father. I'll sing the remaining verses this evening. when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Father and mother, forsake me. The Lord will receive me. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now. The second reading comes from the first letter of the Apostle John. John wrote these words to Christians living one or two generations after Jesus had ascended, at the same time that the Christian church began undergoing its first serious persecutions and threats. And yet in these words of encouragement, John reminds Christians then and now that not only would God give them his light, but God would indeed make us his lights to shine his word into the world in which we live. A lesson from 1 John chapter 2. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. 
This old command is the message you have heard. Yet, I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel and join to sing the gospel acclamation. chapter 4. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said and I will send you to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing the nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we'll join to sing the hymn of the day, O Christ, our true and only light. It's number 904.
grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Amen. Our text for consideration today is taken from Isaiah chapter 8, when we again, or chapter 9, where we again read verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. This is the word of the Lord. Let us now bow our heads in prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I'm sure it has. Have you ever gone out for lunch with maybe a good friend or maybe a client or, for me, a a member? And as you order and you get your hamburger or whatever they ordered, you look up and you see that they have half their lunch on their beard. What do you do? Do you say something or don't you say something? If you say something, you know, it's kind of embarrassing, right? And if you don't say something, they go to the bathroom, they come back, well, why didn't you tell me I had all this over my beard? Why didn't you tell me I thought you were a good friend of mine? So would you say something? Raise your hand if you'd say something. Or would you not say something and maybe give them two minutes to figure it out? And usually what I do I usually just kind of go like this after two minutes, and they usually get the clue. But as I look at all of you, I consider all of you my friends, but I also know that I'm your pastor, not only your pastor, your your shepherd, and not only your shepherd, but also a watchman over your soul. And I'm not looking at your faces right now, even though I am, but I'm not looking for any food on your faces But I'm looking at your heart, I'm looking at your mind, and I'm looking at your soul. And I don't know if I should say something, but I will say something, because I love you, and I don't want you to be embarrassed on the last day. So when I look at your heart, mind, and soul, I see that you have the world all over it all over them, every single part, mind, heart, and soul. And maybe some of you are saying, no, I don't see that on my heart, mind, and soul. Well, let's just take a a closer look. But before we take a closer look, you know, have you ever said this as you sit here, as you listen to a sermon? Maybe you're going, oh, this is going to be a good text. This is going to be a really good text for so-and-so, or I wish so-and-so was here because this is the text he really needs to hear. Pastor Schultz will blow him out of the water. Is that all you feel sometimes? Because this is what our Lord tells us here. He says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? The words I speak here are for you and you alone. I want you to put the blinders on, okay, and say, no, this word here tonight is for me. What is God trying to tell me about my life in this word tonight? It's not like for that person or that person. This word is for you tonight. How many of you maybe say something like this? Well, at least I still come to church I'm here tonight in everything. I come to church more than other people do. If that comforts you, well, then I maybe point you back to the past. If the generation that was before us, or the two generations before us, we never missed church. There was never an excuse to miss church, ever. And if we were sick, we had to give visible proof that we were sick to mom or dad. And uh, if it snowed, the church was always open. And everyone usually tried to get to church at all times. I can remember walking back from school and uh, in three-foot drifts, a mile and a half. It wasn't uphill both ways. But again, going to school and getting to church, that was never like, well, are we going this weekend or not? But it's so easy to get into a pattern and say, oh, well, I've already heard this before. I cannot remember going to Churchill, too, and if I didn't sing the hymns, guess what? Mom would make us write the hymns five times after worship. 
I guess that was law motivation, not gospel motivation. But one thing my parents did for me, they imprinted it on me that was very important to stay in the word, to stay in the light, to stay in the life. And that is only if we stay in his word at all times. Maybe some of you say, well, you know, I don't always come here every Sunday or anything like that. But I do send my kids to a Christian day school and I make sure that they are here every day. And that's great. But if you're not here on a weekend, you know what? They're not going to grow up to be like your third or fourth grade teacher. Their third or fourth grade teacher, they're going to grow up to be like mom and dad. What example are you giving them? You know, this uh, last fall, and I'm going to be starting this again and everything, I was trying to meet with our 100, 100 plus uh, families here at uh, Emmanuel Lutheran School, and I probably got around through 30 families, and I would say it was half and half. When I went through God's great exchange, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Half the parents didn't really know. And if I would say, well, if God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? Half the parents said, well, I hope so. I, I'll try my best in everything. But what was really remarkable, when the kids came in with parents, the children always knew. It's amazing because they're remaining in the light. They hear it every day because they're going to Christian day school. But it's so easy to get out of that light. And all of a sudden, darkness creeps in. Maybe it's creeping into your life right now. Or how about this? Do you rejoice with those who say, let us go to the house of the Lord? Or do you kind of look at this like, oh, no, it's church. Again, I, I can't read your hearts or minds or thoughts, but God can. And when he peers into your mind and thoughts and hearts and souls, what does he see? Or how about this from the psalmist who says this? Do we say the same thing? Delight, I delight in the word of the Lord and meditate on his word day and night? Or is this about it? Or how about this? Is this our attitude? I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding. Is that true of you? I trust in the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul with all my mind, and I will not lean on my own understanding? Or is the Lord the third or fourth opinion? We rather go after the professional thoughts, the scientists. Maybe we look at karma, right? Horoscopes, whatever. And if that's what happens, like we hear in our text for today, you're going to go even farther into darkness. For it says this, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists, who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of of warning. If anyone does not speak according to to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they'll roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they'll be thrust into utter darkness. The only way to stay out of darkness is to stay in the light of his word. But maybe as you look at your life, maybe you feel like you are in despair. Maybe you feel like it's all gloom and doom. It's because darkness is starting to creep into your heart, soul, and mind. And maybe that's why we feel pretty cruddy sometimes, right? Right? I think we do feel cruddy, but again, we didn't, don't feel as cruddy as the people in Isaiah's time. Can you imagine that? Assyria devoured Israel and Babylon, carried off Judah, and they sat there in their captivity, depressed, gloom and doom. They had nothing to look forward to. You see, what I just did for all of you, hopefully, I exposed the darkness I brought you into the darkness. Because right now, maybe your conscience is devouring. I thought I was okay, but you know what? I see that the world is all over my heart, soul, and mind. I brought you into the darkness in order to wake you up and God willing to keep you up. 
Remember what the Apostle Paul tells us here in Romans 13? The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now that we are awake, we can thank God for his law because the law really slaps us in the face, doesn't it, to wake us up. And it's the law that's like the microscope that really goes through our our hearts and minds and souls and, and it shows us all our sins. But again, here comes the gospel, the telescope. It brings other things into focus now. And I'm going to take you back to 2,000 years ago. A great light has dawned. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was born. And he suffered and he died for us. He is crucified for us. By his wounds we are now healed. Completely healed. All our sins are gone forever. Stay awake. Stay in the light. And also spread the light. It's what the Lord wants us to do. I cannot remember uh, years ago when we had our drive from Vermont to Wisconsin. It was like a 20-hour trip to get to Milwaukee. And I can remember always driving straight through. And Lori would always watch uh, the children. I hardly ever let her drive. I, I gave her the, the worst job. And driving was by far easier and everything. But I can remember, how do I keep myself up over that 20 hours in the car? Well, the first thing I did, I, I was just excited the first four hours, right? You know, getting to go home to Wisconsin, you know, and, and seeing parents and loved ones. And that kept me uh, going for the first four hours. And then after those first four hours uh, wore off, uh, what did I do to keep myself up? Out came the, 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 the thermos of coffee. And after the coffee has go- gone, then what did I do? I would always uh, get on my headphones, and so I wouldn't have to listen to Barney in the back seat anymore because we went through all those VHSs so many times with this big uh, 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 tube TV yet. And then after the music wore off, well, then I would open up the window again and again and again. And maybe I'd even stop and stay active. Maybe I'd get out by a rest stop and do a few push-ups and get right back in because the kids were sleeping. And when that didn't work, you know, and again, open up the window, then I would probably wake up Lori so that I'd have a conversation with her and everything, so that would keep me up for a little bit more. And then when she would start to snooze off once again, I would literally have to physically slap myself to keep myself awake. But then it was always around Chicago. The sunset, or not the sunset, but the sun would rise. And when the light came, it changed everything. It changed everything. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are on a journey here in this world right now. And it's not 20 hours. It's maybe 60 to 70 or 80, maybe 90 years. How do we stay awake? Well, we stay awake by, well, remembering where we are called to and where we are going. We have that heavenly home that we can look forward to. Remember what Jesus says, In my Father's house there are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go there and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. And then Thomas goes, How do we know the way to the place you're going? And then Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. That's where we're going. And how else do we uh, stay awake? by continuing to eat and listen to his word day in and day out. That keeps us awake. What else do do we do uh, to keep uh, ourselves awake? To open up God's word, open up the window, and we hear all these comforting verses like, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or how about John 3, 17? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Or Galatians 5, 1, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burned again by a yoke of slavery. Now how about this? By his wounds, we have been healed. What else do we do to stay awake? By worshiping our Lord every day with the lives we lead. 
by acts of service. You can call them good works. We're not doing good works to get to heaven. We're doing good works because we know that we have heaven that's been provided for us through Jesus. How do I stay awake? By staying active, by loving each other, as we heard in our second reading for today. And how do we stay awake? We stay awake by continuing again to hear that word and that law that slaps us uh, wide awake all the time. You know, going back to the first part of the sermon, you know, what do you do when you find someone has, you know, something in between their teeth or on their beard or something like that? What do you do? Say something or don't say anything? Well, the Lord sees your hearts today. He sees your souls today. He sees your minds today. And he sees that they're filthy with the world and all sin but he doesn't just motion to us and say, hey, you have something on your heart, soul, and mind. He comes down to us, and he wipes all that sin completely away. Again, we are now awake. May we stay awake and stay in the light. One of my favorite passages is right here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us not give up meeting together. Now is the time to rejoice as those who rejoice over plunder. Now is the time to rejoice as someone rejoicing at the time of harvest. You see, this here is just life. This is just our bonus. The best is yet to come. Again, may we stay awake. May we stay in the light, and may we spread the light to others. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. Let us now confess our Christian faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the prayer of the church. We'll join together in the responsive prayer of the church. You can follow along on page 16 of the service folder or on the screens. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, in the fullness of time you came into our world to save us from sin and death. You ushered in the day of grace so long foretold. Beloved Son of the Father, revered by the Magi, baptized by John, You came preaching and teaching, healing and comforting, forgiving and encouraging. You brought the light of life to those walking in darkness and the joy of salvation to those doomed to death. Prince of Peace, shine like a beacon for us and the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth. Open our own lips to speak your name to those around us who still live without faith or hope. Arouse us and our missionaries to flood the world with the light of your gospel. 
Lord of the Church, let your peace rule in our hearts that we may use our gifts to serve you and each other in willing gratitude and joy. Watch over our loved ones near and far, that they may remember your love and rejoice in salvation. Strengthen the faith of the sick and the disheartened, and give hope to those in despair and comfort to those who mourn. Be gracious to all and lead us to reflect your love in everything we say and do. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Finally, Lord Jesus, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home where we will stand in the full light of your glory and with all your saints and angels sing the everlasting song of triumph. Amen. At this time, we'll gather our offering, which allows us to carry out mission work here at Emmanuel and around the world as well. As the offering baskets are passed, you can place into them a connection card. If you're visiting us, fill out the gold side of that card. If you're a member here at Emmanuel, fill out the black side of the card. That's where you can also indicate uh, your attendance at the Lord's Supper. Please help us stay in touch with you. Place them in the offering baskets or hand one to me on your way out of the worship this evening. We'll gather the offering. Our service continues with the celebration of the sacrament on page 17. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father. Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
how may this true body and blood strengthen you and keep you in the one true faith until life everlasting. You are at peace with God. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. I've got a couple of announcements. I won't read them all, but there's a bunch of information in these yellow folders that gets you up to speed with events that are going on, especially gatherings and some meetings that are taking place on our calendar. So it's a great place to get your calendars filled up with information as well. How many of you know at least one of your next door neighbors by their first name? How many of you know at least one of your neighbors? How many of you know all of your neighbors' names? But he had at least one neighbor you know by their first name. Can you imagine your neighbor, whom you know by name, calling you up in the middle of the afternoon one day and saying, Hey, I've got a leak underneath my dishwasher and I don't know what to do about it. Can you come over and look at it with me? And if you were to hear that on the phone from your neighbor, you would say, That sounds like a job for a professional and hang up on him. Would any of you be in that kind of sort? You would, you would maybe say to them, well, I'm, I'm not a professional, but I'm perfectly happy to come over and take a look at it for you, right? Just because that's what being neighborly is. Or if you had a neighbor that said, hey, our power is out. Do you have a flashlight that we could borrow? You could say, well, that's my flashlight. You can't have it. No, our neighbors, sometimes they need us to speak with them. And, and it reminds us, can you imagine if you said, hey, you wouldn't believe it. I just took a class on how to fix dishwashers. I'll be right over here at Emmanuel, can you ima imagine a, a friend or someone you know calling you up and say, hey, I've got a leak going on in my faith life right now. I, I don't know how to fix what's going on in my life. Can you just come over and talk to me about it? And for us to say, well, that sounds like a pastor's job and just hang up on him. Or to say, I would, I'd be happy to come over and talk to you. In fact, I just took a class on that at Emmanuel. This uh, coming, not this weekend coming, but on the first weekend in February, we have a, a seminar that's going on on our campus called Everyone Outreach. And it just is a, a conversation with, with leaders in our congregation, leaders in our synod, about how to share our faith with, with people, or it's simply how to build a culture of neighborhood evangelism on our campus. We've had a lot of our members already go through that course, and we'd like to have a lot more uh, of our lay members go through the course as well. There's posters that you see out, and if you have any questions and would like to attend, it's a Saturday afternoon and a Sunday afternoon after church, kind of a two-day workshop. Uh, but Pastor Schultz is putting it together. I wanted to extend an invite to you if you're interested. Talk to me after the service. Talk to Pastor Schultz after the service about how can I learn how to easily and with more confidence just talk to other people about my church or about my Savior. It's a really cool opportunity for us here at Emmanuel. Also, this coming weekend and beyond, there are Bible studies for getting enriched with God's Word. Uh, Pastor Schultz is leading a Bible class uh, tomorrow in the, com the community room. There's a women's Bible study called the Armor of God starting in the conference room. And then there's a parent's Bible class on love and logic. That's going to be happening upstairs in the school in a couple of weeks. So take a look inside that yellow packet and you can get information there. Then finally, some divine call news. Uh, first of all, this coming Tuesday, we have another call meeting for our associate pastor of discipleship. That'll be happening. I think it's at 7.30 in the evening. There's 7 o'clock. It's in the packet. Take a look at that. Um, and then the following Thursday of this same week, we have three teacher calls going out. Uh, one of our teaching staff has opted not to uh, serve in the teaching role next year. She composed a letter for us. I wanted to read that letter. Dear members of Emmanuel, after much prayer and deliberation, I've decided to resign from my position as fourth grade teacher at Emmanuel Lutheran School, which will go into effect at the end of this school year. 
I am truly grateful for the time I was given to serve here and have learned so much from my experience. Thank you for your support over the past three years. Although our plans through life may change, what a blessing it is to know that we always have a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. May God continue to bless the ministry at Emmanuel, your sister in Christ, uh, Mrs. Sarah Osterman. We have enjoyed the, the service of the Ostermans being on our campus for the past three years. They arrived on our doorstep in the middle of COVID when they were serving in China and now have all of a sudden been uh, relocated to London. They're into some other ventures coming up into the years ahead, but we ask that God bless them if you have a chance to encourage the Ostermans you're encouraged to do that as well. And then the final one is, I got a divine call on Sunday, uh, and so I have to read you this letter. Uh, we deliberate these divine calls for a couple of weeks, uh, but just an encouragement. We're, we're very happy where we're serving. Dear members of Emmanuel Lutheran Church, this past week I received a divine call to serve at um, St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Rapid City, South Dakota. That's far from here. While I'm humbled to consider their call, I'm also honored to consider the call that I presently hold among God's people here at Emmanuel. In the weeks ahead, I'll deliberate this call and ask for your prayers and counsel and encouragement. You have, you have been and continue to be a great blessing for me and my family. As always, the power and guidance of God's Holy Spirit is our comfort and our confidence. So encouragements uh, as we consider calls. Pastors throughout our synod are getting them about every five months now. Uh, because of the number of vacancies, teachers are also getting them on a very aggressive calendar. The Lord of the Church is in charge, but he's guiding us in, in issuing calls to others and also as we uh, consider them as well. Did I get just about everything off your list? I think so. I, I think, think it's longer so. than my sermon today. Well, I'm just I'm trying to be efficient here. God's richest blessings to all of you throughout the week.